VLC. We offer value, providing you with quality review programs and online seminars that bring out the best in you. At VLC, we listen. Adapting to the times, we brought our in-demand on-ground review lectures online with our virtual law companion. 
Subscribing to this online learning platform means you get 24-7 access to our updated video lectures and bar review notes from the best and most respected lecturers and professors. At VLC, we collaborate, working with the best technology providers through our learning management system to best prepare you for the first ever digitalized bar exams. We work hand-in-hand -hand with legal experts you can trust, providing top-notch services to those who need it the most through our free online legal consultations and free lecture series. Value. Listen and collaborate. This is the VLC way. And we are VLC.
Only a just me is a search warrant or warrant of arrest. Nobody else. That is very important. And before a just me is a search warrant or warrant of arrest, what are the requirements? First, there may be probable cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four, particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending at the Supreme Court now, diba? Right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize unceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidized... within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code. As a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Honor, honor or lawful possession of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, they may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repent and Issuals of a warrant of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause by the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of warrant of arrest. So, okay, yeah. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant, as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath of affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proven, okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by a, by the previous uh, investigator during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So it's not enough.
Good day to our dear attendees from different parts of the country. I pray that you're all in great state of health. This free webinar is streaming live via the Villales Law Center's YouTube channel and Facebook page. If you can hear my voice clearly, please type in the comment section, hashtag VLC. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Optimize this learning opportunity. Share this free online lecture to your friends and together learn at the comfort of your homes. I want to formally welcome you all to this free webinar. This is part of a series of free online lectures brought to you by the virtual law companion of Villages Law Center. Allow me to share to you this good news. The Virtual Law Companion is the newest innovation of Villages Law Center, which aims to provide an easy, convenient, and quality bar review experience. The Virtual Law Companion is a web application that is hosted on a dedicated cloud server. It can be accessed via the internet 24-7 for any web browser using any device or handheld computers like Android or iOS phones. Meaning, you can study anytime, anywhere, and from any mobile device. Please visit our website at www.biliasislawcenter.com to know more about our programs and activities. Before we formally start, please take note of some reminders. First, this free webinar is pre-recorded to ensure the uninterrupted streaming of lectures. Secondly, VLC team will be with you to assist you should you need more information about our program. Please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Without further ado, please give your virtual class and welcome our lecturer today. Again, this free webinar is brought to you by our virtual law company. Maraming salamat po. Together, we can make things happen. Together, we can. Our lecturer finished philosophy at the San Pablo Seminary in Baguio City. He finished Bachelor of Laws at the University of the Cordilleras, formerly Baguio College's foundation. He is enrolled in the Master's of Law program at the San Beda University Graduate School of Law. He is a former president of Veritas Research and Development Institute, and a former consultant to Japan Bank for International Cooperation or JBIC. He is a law professor and bar reviewer in labor law in various law schools and bar reviewer at several bar review centers, including Villasis Law Center. Our lecturer is also an author of books namely, Survival Notes in Labor Law, Bar Syllabus Based Reviewer in Labor Law, Questions and Answers in Labor Law, Labor Standards Law, A Remunerative and Protective Law, and Labor Relations Law, A Tenurial and Organizational Law. He is a member of the UP Law Center Panel of Experts in Labor Law. Currently, he is a Labor Arbiter at the National Labor Relations Commission. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Benedict G. Cutto. Present uh, viewing, welcome to Aspects of Labor Procedure. The way of overview of the 20 uh, points of interest of any bar examiner in labor law, labor procedure happens to be a mainstay, um, examinable area. And therefore, I have to see to it that you will master aspects of uh, jurisdiction. So the coverage of this uh, lecture will uh, include number one, uh, labor jurisdiction, number two, uh, confirmment of jurisdiction. Number three, acquisition of jurisdiction. Four, uh, exercise of jurisdiction, judgments, appeals, and uh, 
execution of uh, judgment. I hope that uh, in the next uh, 60 minutes we would be able to we would be able to uh, cover all these uh, aspects. So let's uh, proceed to the first, which is a very crucial aspect of labor problem, which is labor jurisdiction. <clears throat> Here is a simple situation: a labor dispute or one arising from employer-employee relationship is uh, brought to a labor tribunal, like the office of the labor arbiter. Does it uh, follow? that the labor arbiter can proceed to hear and determine or resolve that dispute? The answer is no. The uh, case of Isnadi told us that not all disputes arising from EER, that is employer-employee relationship, are for labor tribunals to hear and resolve. There are disputes arising from that affair which are uh, reserved or assigned to the courts for resolution. So how do you know that the dispute brought, which is uh, EER related, brought to a labor tribunal, is for that tribunal to hear and resolve or determine? <clears throat> the case of uh, Alaguena et al. versus Pal tells us that uh, you will uh, send that case to that labor tribunal only if the case is resolvable through the application solely of labor law, solely of labor law. So the two jurisdictional rules in this regard, therefore, are the reasonable causal connection rule and the sole reference to labor law rules. So again, the first rule is the reasonable causal connection rule, and the second is the sole reference to labor law rule. The first requires that the origin of the dispute be EER. So again, that means uh, employer-employee relationship. And the second requires that the case be resolvable through the application solely of uh, labor law. So the need, therefore, to revisit uh, EER tests, of course, you are masters of uh, EER tests. The uh, reasonable causal connection rule admits, of course, of certain exceptions, and there are several exceptions that uh, we can cite. Number one is uh, the concept of uh, a labor dispute in Article 290 of the Labor Code. You will remember that the definition of a labor dispute in the provision includes this phrase, regardless of whether the disputants stand in the proximate relation of employer and employee. That phrase is very important. You have to bring it with you to the bar exam because it means that it is possible to have a labor dispute outside employer-employee relationship. And therefore, even outside that relationship, it is possible for a labor tribunal like the Office of the Regional Director or the Bureau of Labor Relations to come in to hear and resolve the case. And by way of example, we have inter-union disputes and intra-union disputes. Obviously, uh, the disputants in these uh, types of labor disputes okay, are not parties to employer-employee relationship because the parties to inter-union disputes are two or more labor organizations, so all employees. Okay, and in intra-union disputes, the disputants are members of the same labor organization. So these are two types of labor disputes. They are very much labor disputes even if they do not involve employer-employee relationship. And yet, if we send these disputes for resolution to the regional director or to the Bureau of Labor Relations, depending on the size of the labor organization involved. So the regional director sits to hear and resolve these inter- and intra-union disputes if the labor organization or organizations involved are the small ones, like uh, workers' associations, like independent unions. But if the labor organization involved is a big one, is a mother labor organization, like a national union or the federation, then it gets the dispute gets to be heard by the Bureau of uh, Labor Relations. So that is the first exception to the reasonable causal connection rule. The definition of a labor dispute, in particular, that phrase, in Article 219. The second exception is Section 7 of uh, Republic Act 10022 or the New Migrants Act of 2010. Here is an OFW recruited by a uh, license, uh, a local recruiter. Uh, he uh, pays uh, placement and related fees, but he does not get deployed. If minded to recover his money, what can he do? can file a money complaint for recovery with the Office of the Labor Arbiter, but take note of what the Supreme Court told us in the case of C.F. Sharp, that an OFW becomes a party to EER only if actually deployed. 
So what is this fellow, an undeployed OFW, doing before the labor arbiter? Can he litigate his money claims before the uh, labor arbiter without violating the reasonable counsel connection rule? And the answer is uh, yes, the law permits him to litigate his uh, money claims before the DLA. Take note that uh, the LA has jurisdiction over money claims of OFWs if those money claims arise from one, two, three. Where number one is, of course, employer-employee relationship. Number two is contract. Number three is law. In C.F. Sharp, the Supreme Court made a distinction between the birth of employer-employee relationship and the perfection of an employment contract. Okay, your OFW is undeployed and therefore he cannot be considered an employee at any point, no? But then he has signed an employment contract or he has perfected a contract with his foreign employer to the local uh, recruiter. That perfected contract generates enforceable rights. So in the event of violations of those uh, rights created under that contract, enforcement shall be before the office of the labor arbiter. So please list that down as uh, the second exception to the reasonable causal connection rule. Third exception would be ULPs under Article 260. The question in the bar is whether or not EER is an element of uh, ULP. There are two provisions of PD442 that give us uh, lists of ULPs. Number one is Article 259, which gives us the list of ULPs committed by employers, and Article 260, which gives us the second list, list of ULPs committed by labor organizations. Under 259, the uh, uh, violator is an employer, the victim is a worker, and therefore EER is an element of a 259 ULP. But of course, subject to uh, at least this exception, here is a, a, job applicant, uh, a job applicant, okay? Uh, his uh, employment is conditioned on his undertaking not to join a union or to join a particular union designated by the company. That is ULP under 259, even if the victim is a job applicant, so not yet a party to EER. Now, in contrast, under 260, where the violator is a labor organization, you will not always look for EER because uh, at certain points, EER is not an element of uh, a 260 ULP. Take note that under 260, there are three possible victims. Number one is worker, number two is the union membership, and number three is the employer. Complaining of violation by the labor organization of uh, its duty to collectively bargain, complaining of violation by the labor organization of the CBA, or complaining of feather padding. So where the victim is the employer, then EER is an element of those three uh, or those uh, ULPs. But where the victim is a worker or uh, the union membership, then uh, you have a labor dispute even in the absence of uh, EER. And of course, you know that under 224, it is the LA who gets to hear complaints for ULPs. For ULPs. So by way of a third exception to the reasonable causal connection rule, <clears throat> ULP under 260 where the victim is a worker or the union membership okay, uh, can be heard by the labor arbiter. So there's no violation in that case of the reasonable causal connection rule. Fourth exception is uh, uh, Advisory 4, Series of 2016. This advisory pertains to talents. And this advisory does not make a distinction between talents. You know that there are talents who are independent contractors and talents who are really employees. But this advisory, advisory for series of 2016, does not make that distinction. In fact, it expressly says that it applies to all talents. Now, take note that the two important features of this advisory are, number one, it guarantees employee rights, like right to eight-hour labor, right to 30-month pay, to all talents without any distinction. In other words, employee rights are guaranteed even to non-employees like independent contractor talents. And on top of that, in the event of any violation of the rights okay, uh, guaranteed by this advisory to all talents, enforcement shall be with the office of the regional director. Suppose the victim, the complainant, is an independent contractor talent. He is required by this advisory to go to ventilate his cause before the RD. Now, 
first, uh, this uh, runs contrary to the reasonable causal connection rule because an independent contractor talent cannot be a party to employer-employee relationship, but this should be treated as an additional exception. Okay? Even if the advisory, uh, for that reason and to that extent, uh, might be uh, uh, questionable. We will apply, of course, the uh, doctrine of uh, uh, this uh, operative fact doctrine so that advisory shall be allowed to produce legal effects because under the law it is valid until annulled in an appropriate case. So those are among the important exceptions uh, that uh, you can expect the bar examiner to give you in uh, November. Now, I'd like to invite your attention to a very important uh, aspect of uh, EER, which is a post-employment claim. What is a post-employment claim? Here is an employee, he signs an employment contract, but with this undertaking, that he shall not join a competitor company within the stipulated period, okay? otherwise he would be liable for liquidated damages. So what is that undertaking? It is a non-compete clause. In the case of Portillo versus uh, Rudolf Litz, given in the bar once already, after that, uh, no question on post-employment claim or on uh, non-compete clause. But I believe that the examiner or the examiners this year might just uh, go back to this uh, point. In Portillo, an employee uh, undertook not to join a competitor company within two years from his uh, resignation, etc., etc. He violated his undertaking. Reason the company withheld his last pay or her last uh, pay. So that prompted her to run to the Office of the Labor Arbiter to uh, uh, file a recovery complaint. In the case before the LA initiated by her recovery complaint, the company interposed a counterclaim for liquidated damages based on her violation of the non-compete clause. Question. Does the labor arbiter have jurisdiction over the case? If you are, that, if you are asked uh, that question, remember that the case has two aspects, namely the money claim of the employee and number two, the counterclaim of the employer. Can the labor arbiter resolve both claims? As to the first, okay, we uh, apply the two uh, jurisdictional rules, namely the reasonable counsel connection rule and the sole reference to labor law rule. So, what is the origin of the money claim brought by the employee through his complaint? <clears throat> Employer employee relationship. Okay. How is that? Uh, how is the money issue brought to be resolved? Through the application of labor law. In particular, Article 1. 16 of uh, PD442 on withholding of uh, wages. But as to the employer's uh, counterclaim for liquidated damages, the labor arbiter cannot hear that. Why? Because it is a post employment claim. And therefore, applying the reasonable causal connection rule, you will not allow the labor arbiter to hear and determine that counterclaim. So, what is a post employment claim? Entitlement to liquidated damages based on violation of an employee of his undertaking not to join a competitor company within the stipulated period okay, is a post-employment matter. Why? Because violation of a non-compete clause okay, giving rise to the uh, right of the employee to employer to uh, liquidated damages can only happen after termination of employer-employee relationship. So the employee resigns as in Portillo. That resignation uh, terminates employer-employee relationship. So if he violates his undertaking, entitling his employer to liquidated damages, those uh, liquidated damages are what you call post-employment uh, uh, damages or uh, matter. So that is the concept of a post-employment claim. So that is Portillo, but take note that the Supreme Court decided another case involving a non-compete clause, this time in the case of Century Properties versus uh, Babiano et al. Take note that the uh, non-compete clause or the non-involvement clause was crafted differently. Was crafted differently. And like in Portillo, it provided as follows. I hereby undertake not to join a competitor company within two years from retirement. Okay, or from separation from uh, service as an employee, okay, as a consultant, or as an agent. 
So I hereby undertake not to join a competitor company as an employee, agent, or uh, consultant within two years. While employed, the employee served a competitor company as an advisor. In that case, in the event the employer uh, asserts a claim for uh, counter a counter claim for damages, you will not treat that claim as a post employment claim anymore. Why? Because it is possible to violate that kind of a non involvement or non compete clause while the employee is uh, employed. How? If that employee joins a competitor company as a consultant or as an agent, not necessarily as an employee, but as a consultant or agent. So if that is the case, then the employer's counterclaim shall not be treated as a post-employment claim. And therefore, if asserted in the same case initiated by the complaint of the employee before the labor arbiter, you will permit the labor arbiter to hear and resolve that counterclaim. Okay. Now, let's go to the second rule, which is the sole reference to labor law rule. In Islani, as I said a while back, okay, the Supreme Court said that not all disputes arising from employer-employee relationship are for labor tribunals to hear and resolve. So when do you allow them to resolve uh, EER-related disputes if those disputes are resolvable through the application solely of labor law, only exclusively of labor law? So at this point, we are compelled to look into the meaning, the concept, or the identity of labor law for purposes of properly applying the second rule. So what is labor law for purposes of the sole reference to labor law rule? The case of Halagwenya versus uh, Pal will help us understand the identity or the concept of uh, labor law. What happened in Halagwenya et al. versus Pal? Philippine Airlines had a CBA with the union representing its flight attendants and Section 144 of that CBA had it that the female flight attendants shall be retired earlier than their male counterparts. How earlier? Earlier by five years. <clears throat> Patricia Halagwenya and fellow female flight attendants felt, believed that uh, the provision was discriminatory to women. They believed that it violated several laws. Okay? And therefore, they wanted to get a nullification judgment. As to law, they uh, claimed that it violated the labor code. It's a guarantee on equality. You find that guarantee in uh, uh, Article 3. You find it also in Article 135. They claimed that it violated Section 14, Article 2 of the Constitution on Fundamental Equality. They claimed that it violated the CEDAW. And they claimed that it violated relevant provisions of the new civil code on contracts. So how did they propose to get a nullification judgment? They went to court. And by court, we mean the RTC, where they filed a petition for declaratory relief seeking nullification of Section 144 of that CBA. Pal moved to dismiss. On what ground? Lack of jurisdiction. According to Pal, the parties before the RTC were parties to employer-employee uh, relationship and therefore the dispute should have been brought to the voluntary arbitrator. Why voluntary arbitrator? Because of Article 261, which is now Article 274, which confers jurisdiction on the VA over entries of disputes involving CBAs. Now, how did the Supreme Court resolve the jurisdictional challenge raised by PAL? Against PAL and in favor of the jurisdiction of the RTC. For the following reasons. So these were the reasons uh, advanced by the court in uh, sustaining the jurisdiction of the RTC. Number one, take note that the petition filed with the RTC was a petition for declaratory relief. We would said a petition for declaratory relief is for the RTC to hear and resolve in the exercise of its general jurisdiction. Number two reason, Article 261, which is now 274, had no application. Why? Take note of the purpose of the petitioners in going to the RDC. They wanted nullification. And the Supreme Court was quick to remark that nullification was entirely different from either CBA interpretation or implementation. So for that second reason, Paul uh, failed in its bid to convince uh, the Supreme Court that the RTC had no jurisdiction. Third reason advanced by the Supreme Court. This one pertains now to the sole reference to labor law rule. The issue up for resolution was the validity of a contractual proof. 
understand that a CBA is a contract and therefore section 144 of the CBA in question was a contractual provision. And the issue to resolve was whether or not that provision, that contractual provision was valid. And how was that validity issue to be resolved? So we said resolvable through the application not solely of labor law, meaning not solely of the labor code, other labor relations statutes or collective bargaining agreement, but resolvable through the application also of Section 14, Article 2 of the Constitution, the CEDA or Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and resolvable also through the application of relevant provisions of the new civil code on contracts. So that was the sole reference to labor law uh, rule at play. The question. What then is labor law for purposes of the sole reference to labor law? The Halaguanya court gave us a definition by enumeration. Labor law is the labor code, other labor statutes, and CBA. By no means, of course, is that definition complete or comprehensive. It is obviously incomplete. So it doesn't answer the question, what is the identity of labor law or what is labor law? Actually, labor law can be any law. It can be a provision of the uh, corporation code. It can be a provision of the new civil code or other law. What makes that other law labor law? Its ability to resolve a labor issue. So if a law can resolve the labor issue for that reason and to that extent, it shall be treated as labor law for purposes of the sole reference to labor law rule. By way of example, CARAG versus NLRC gives us a provision of uh, the corporation code, namely Section 31, okay, uh, which provision was used to resolve a labor issue. What was the issue resolved? Whether or not to hold a corporate officer liable or solidarily liable with his uh, company. In CARAG, the labor arbiter resolved that issue through the application of Article 212 which is now 219 of the Labor Code. Okay, so he held that the corporate officer was uh, solidarily liable with his company because uh, by virtue of the definition of an employer in that provision, he himself was employer. What is the definition of an employer in the provision? The definition includes this uh, phrase. Okay, an employer is one or any person, includes any person acting in the interest of an employer directly or indirectly, which means that uh, since corporate officer no, acts uh, in the interest of his uh, company directly, then he should be treated okay, as employer and on that basis, he can be held solidarily liable in this company. So pretty much said, you do not apply Article 212 of the Labor Code to resolve the issue. The law to apply is Section 31 of the Corporation Code, which is now Section 30 of the Revised Corporation Code. So the question to ask and answer is whether or not the respondent officer has been acting in the interest of the respondent corporation directly or indirectly. That is the wrong question to ask and answer. The questions to ask are those demanded by Section 30 of the Revised Corporation Code, namely, has the... Uh, Respondent officer participated in the illegality complaint. Of. If not, has he ratified that illegality? If not, has he uh, uh, committed a grossly negligent act resulting in the legal injury complaint? Of? If the answer to those questions is yes, 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 then on that basis you can hold that corporate officer solidarily liable to this company. So, what is the lesson from Carag versus NLRC? Any law can be labor law as long as it can be used to resolve a labor issue. So any law includes Section 30 of the Corporation Code. So if the identity of a labor law depends on its ability to resolve a labor issue, we have to know the character of a labor issue. What is a labor issue then? It is one that arises from a labor dispute, which brings us back to Article 2119. To 219, rather, for the definition of a labor dispute. So, based on the definition, labor disputes are labor standards disputes, organizational disputes, representation disputes, and tenurial disputes. Of course, the first uh, labor standards uh, disputes are disputes generated by violations of uh, remunerative labor standards law or Book 3, 
or violations of Book 4 or uh, Health and Safety Rules. Violations of workers' right to self-organization will generate uh, organizational disputes. Disputes between labor organizations, usually fighting over majority representative status, generate uh, representation disputes and violations of right to security of tenure will generate tenurial disputes. So issues arising from these disputes must be labor disputes and any law, whether labor code, other labor statutes, or non-labor law used to resolve those issues become or will assume the character of labor law. So that is labor law for purposes of sole reference to. Let's now proceed to a very important aspect of labor procedure. Now that uh, you know, you are already masters of uh, jurisdictional rules. Let's now proceed to conferment of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction okay, is, of course, the power to hear and resolve uh, a dispute. The disputes no? uh, enumerated under 219. And you know that uh, Article uh, 218 requires the state to provide administrative machineries for the expeditions and inexpensive resolution of labor disputes as contemplated by Article 219. And by administrative machineries, we mean the labor tribunals or agencies uh, assigned uh, their respective competencies. Uh, in resolving types of labor disputes. So we refer to the offices of the voluntary arbitrator, labor arbiter, regional director, med arbiter. Of course, uh, we do not uh, uh, wall out the POEA and the NCMB. But let's focus first on the VA, the LA, the RD, and the med arbiter. So what are the cases assigned to them? To start with the office of the voluntary arbitrator. The provisions to consult are 274 and 275. Take note that the VA has two types of jurisdiction. Number one, traditional jurisdiction. Number two, jurisdiction by stipulation. Article 274 assigns to the VA his traditional jurisdiction, meaning he has jurisdiction over unresolved disputes arising from CBA interpretation or implementation and unresolved disputes arising from company personal policy enforcement or implementation. So, if you are asked about the traditional jurisdiction of the VA, you get that from Article 274. 275 allows the VA to hear additional cases outside 274. So, even cases listed under 224, which are assigned to the labor arbiter, can be heard and resolved by the uh, VA. When? When there is an express stipulation in a CBA or similar agreement assigning additional cases to the VA, in which case he exercises jurisdiction okay, over those additional cases, and that jurisdiction is what you call jurisdiction by stipulation. If you go back to civil procedure, you will recall that jurisdiction, you will recall the rule that jurisdiction over the subject matter of a case is conferred by law only. But by way of exception, in labor law, jurisdiction can be conferred by stipulation or agreement. And that is in accord with Section 3, Article 13 of the Constitution, as held in Vivero, okay, which uh, requires preferential use of uh, voluntary modes of setting labor disputes, including voluntary arbitration. More or less, that is uh, the jurisdiction of the VA. Let's now move to the LA. Question in the bar as if not once, twice, give the jurisdiction of the labor arbiter. So you get the cases from the following, Article 2 to 4. You get additional cases from Section 7, uh, RA 10022, or the Migrants Act. So the four money claims of OFW shall be brought to the labor arbiter. You get additional cases from the POEA SEC. And then you also bring to the labor arbiter enforcement of uh, compromise agreements and uh, referred wage distortion disputes in unorganized establishments. So if you are asked to give the jurisdiction of the labor arbiter, once again, don't limit yourselves to Article 224. You have to include Section 7 of RA 10022 POEA. And the two additional cases which are uh, expressly uh, uh, recognized no, or stated in the rules of procedure of the NLRC, namely referred wage uh, distortion disputes in unorganized establishments based on the labor code and enforcement of compromise agreements. 
What about the regional director? Well, uh, the sources of his uh, powers are 128 and 129. And met arbiter has jurisdiction over CE petitions, basically. So that should take care of conferment of jurisdiction. Now, you know that uh, jurisdiction conferred cannot be exercised unless validly acquired. So the third aspect of labor procedure is acquisition of jurisdiction. How is jurisdiction acquired? So again, let's move from the office of the VA and then to the head arbiter. VA acquires jurisdiction three ways. The three ways of acquiring jurisdiction are number one, submission agreement, number two, notice to arbitrate, and number three, appointment of the VA. Going to voluntary arbitration is a contractual duty where the parties to a CBA are willing to submit their dispute to voluntary arbitration. Okay. All they have to do is to sign and submit a one-page submission agreement. It is through that document that the VA or panel of VAs assigned or named no, in their agreement we, or can get to hear their dispute. So that is the first mode of acquiring jurisdiction. It is through a submission agreement. What if one of the parties is willing to submit himself to voluntary arbitration? Then the willing party okay, may serve a notice to arbitrate. And so it is uh, through that mode that the VA name in their CBA gets to hear and resolve their dispute. And the third is, uh, suppose the parties forgot to name a VA in their agreement. Okay? In that case, the NCNB may appoint a VA for them. Now, in 1989, the parties were allowed to, or under the 1989 rules, parties were allowed to appoint their VA. Under the 2004 rules, only the NCNB can appoint a VA for the parties. Now, I bring you back to the second mode of acquiring jurisdiction, which is notice to arbitrate. In the case of Tabigye versus Interco, EEBR, Exclusive Bargaining Agreement, refused to give a notice to arbitrate on the company. So another reunion served that notice and it was questioned. You cannot serve that. And invoking Article 254, the old 254, that other union argued that it could serve that notice to arbitrate because after all, the provision provided that uh, for purposes of uh, collective bargaining, the worker shall be represented by the EBR, that means exclusive bargaining representative, without prejudice to the right of a worker or group of workers to directly deal with the employer for redress of grievances. So sabi niya, we are that group of workers since we are permitted by 254 to directly deal with the, the company for redress of grievances that we can serve and not this to our people. Supreme Court ruled only an EBR can serve a notice to arbitrate. Only an EBR can serve a notice to arbitrate. So only the company and only the EBR can serve that. Let's go to the regional director. How does he acquire jurisdiction? Through the service of a notice of inspection, which notice may be prompted by complaint or exercise motu proprio of inspection power. It is that simple. It is that simple. And take note in this regard that visitorial power is exercisable over establishments and not over uh, individual workers. Again, visitorial power is exercisable over establishments and not over individual workers, as held by the Supreme Court in Catholic Vicariate of Baguio versus Secretary Santo Tomas. What does that imply or what is the significance of the declaration? There is no need for employees to file complaints with the regional director. As long as that notice uh, of inspection is duly served on an establishment, the regional director acquires jurisdiction over the case. Of course, that is under 128. Under 129, uh, a complaint is required. Why? Because the law requires the bringing of the simple money claim to the regional director. And bringing of that claim means through the filing of a complaint. We go to the med arbiter. He acquires jurisdiction through the filing of a verified petition for certification election. Question, what if that CE petition were not verified? Well, you can easily apply rules from civil procedure that defect is uh, curable. But here is a special reason, uh, which is a labor law uh, justification. A petition for certification election does not initiate 
uh, litigation. In a litigation, one party seeks relief as against another party. So there is a petitioner, there is a respondent, not a complainant, a defendant. But that is not the case in a certification election. You don't have a respondent, you don't have a defendant. Just have a petitioner. In the case of Sandoval Shipyards, the Supreme Court characterized the certification election as a mode of verification only and not a litigation. Okay. So it is a means by which the med arbiter uh, is uh, uh, given the opportunity to determine the choice of the workers as to who the representative should be for purposes of collective bargaining. So a CE petition does not initiate a litigation. For that reason, it is not an initiatory pleading that must be verified. So that should be your second reason no? if uh, asked that a problem. The other characterization, similar characterization, was uh, given by Justice Persimmon in the case of Legend Hotel. A, cer uh, a certification election is uh, uh, investigative in character only. Investigative in character only. So again, it is not a litigation for one party seeks relief as against another party. There is only a petitioner. Okay? There is no litigation to speak of. So give that as your second reason if asked about an unverified CE petition. So we are done with the acquisition of jurisdiction. We are limited to the first level. Administrative uh, bodies, of course, you know, you are aware of the appellate bodies who do not only exercise uh, review powers, they do have uh, original jurisdiction, but uh, time will not permit us to uh, tackle okay, the three aspects of uh, jurisdiction uh, in relation to this uh, review body. So let's move to exercise of jurisdiction. <clears throat> Again, let's move from the voluntary arbitrator uh, to the left to the med arbitrator. Please take note of the case of uh, Abalos et al. versus Felix Mining Company involving a voluntary arbitrator who resolved the case in favor of the complaining dismissed uh, miners, uh, Felix Mining Company. His uh, decision was appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. His decision was sustained. It was brought back to him for purposes of enforcement of judgment. But at the time of enforcement of judgment, the company had already abolished the positions of the miners. So that rendered the physical reinstatement impossible. Receiving the sheriff's report to that effect, the VA issued an alias writ of execution commanding the company to pay separation pay in lieu of reinstatement. And that was questioned. The alias writ of execution ordering payment of separation pay in lieu of reinstatement was questioned by the mining company. Okay. Allegedly, the VA violated two principles, namely the principle of finality of judgments and the principle of immutability of final judgment. According to the company, his decision had attained finality a long time ago, and therefore he could not amend it, modify it by issuing that alias rate of execution. The Supreme Court said the VA, in the exercise of its jurisdiction, could do that. Where enforcement of the original tenor of the VA's decision is uh, impossible by reason of abolition of positions, okay, he can order payment of separation pay in lieu of rent. So that is one case that must be connected to exercise of uh, jurisdiction by the VA. Still on exercise of jurisdiction, when the VA finds illegal dismissal, what are the consequences of the finding of illegal dismissal? Well, in accordance with Santos versus uh, NLRC, which is based on Article uh, 279, which is now two, uh, 280, uh, 294, the logical consequences of the finding are immediate reinstatement and full back wages. So the VA <coughs> orders... Uh, the employer to immediately reinstate and to pay full back wages. The question involved in a case decided by the Supreme Court is whether or not the VA can order immediate reinstatement. Okay? He is not the labor arbiter who can do that. He is a VA and it is not clear whether or not he should or he can also order immediate reinstatement. But the resolution of the issue was uh, tackled by the Supreme Court very, very uh, uh, simply. Supreme Court said, 
The basis of the order or for statement is the same labor code. It is Article 294. Okay, so the reinstatement <clears throat> ordered by the LA is as immediate as the reinstatement ordered by the VA or the other way around. The VA's order of reinstatement is as immediate as the LA's order of reinstatement because both orders are based on the same provision of the labor code. So that is enforcement of, uh, or that is exercise rather of uh, jurisdiction so far as the VA is concerned. Go to the labor arbiter. Still, our topic is uh, exercise of jurisdiction. I bring you to section 18 of uh, rule 11 of the 2011 rules of procedure of the NNRC. What is that provision? Section 18 rule 11. A seafarer is awarded by the labor arbiter disability compensation to the tune of 60,000 US dollars plus 10% attorney's fees, prompting the employer to take an appeal to the NLRC posting an appeal bond in order to be able to perfect that appeal. Up before the NLRC, what happens? The money award is affirmed, prompting now the employer to file an MR, which MR unfortunately is denied. So the next move of the employer is to run to the CA under Rule 65, okay, and to come back with a TRO. If he does not come back with a TRO, judgment will be entered after 10 days and the case will be returned to the labor arbiter for purposes of enforcement of this. The records of the case are now before the labor arbiter. You can conduct a pre-execution conference now and issue a writ of execution thereafter. And then the sheriff will now go after the appeal bond. So the only way to stop enforcement really is to get a TRO from the Rule 65 Court. No TRO, appeal bond is released. But after several months, the employer is able to get a reversal of the money judgment before the CA or before the SC. So he now goes back to the labor arbiter, invoking Section 18, Rule 11 of the Rules Procedure of the NLRC, praying for the issuance of an order of restitution commanding the uh, seafarer to return the employer's uh, money. If you read Section 18 of Rule 11, restitution is premised on an order expressly directing restitution. In other words, the CA, if not the SE, must order restitution as the labor arbitrage basis for ordering restitution. So it is the Wallums case involving restitution, but where the CA did not expressly order restitution. On that basis, the labor arbiter refused to order restitution, so the case had to go back to the SC where the issue resolved was whether or not restitution should be ordered even in the absence of an order of restitution from the CA. And the ruling of the Supreme Court to Justice Peralta was the Seafarer should return his employer's money whether or not restitution is uh, ordered no, by the CA. Why? Because if he does not uh, restitute, then he would be enriched at the expense of his employer. And in addition, the court said common sense requires restitution. Common sense requires restitution. So those were at least the two reasons advanced by the Supreme Court in ordering restitution even in the absence of an express order of restitution uh, from the uh, Court of uh, Appeals. So this uh, case should be connected to exercise of uh, jurisdiction. Now, this other matter pertains to exercise, pertains to acquisition, pertains to conferment of jurisdiction. We are still talking about the labor arbiter. A worker files a complaint charging non-payment of uh, salaries and benefits. So that, based on the four corners of his complaint, those are his uh, causes of action. But in his position paper, he charges illegal dismissal. Is there a need to amend the complaint to enable the labor arbiter to acquire jurisdiction over the additional cause of action, which is illegal dismissal? So that uh, in the absence of an amended complaint, he should dismiss that uh, issue for lack of uh, uh, jurisdiction. In uh, uh, 
Regimenta Chemicals, the Supreme Court allowed the uh, taking cognizance of that additional cause of action not stated in the complaint. The Supreme Court uh, characterized a complaint as a simple checklist of causes, which does not really articulate the uh, complaining worker's cause or causes of action. The Supreme Court said it is really his position paper that fully articulates his cause of action. And therefore, the labor arbiter can uh, 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 take cognizance of uh, issues additionally raised, if not belatedly raised, in the complainant's uh, position paper. Subject, of course, to the rule that uh, what he has uh, stated in his position paper, he can no longer improve you know, uh, in his reply, etc., etc., or in his opinion. Later on. So that is the checklist rule. That is the checklist uh, rule. And a uh, regional director, okay, how does he exercise 128 power as well as 129 power? 129 by issuing uh, uh, a decision or a judgment uh, commanding payment of the uh, unpaid uh, simple money claim. No problem with that. Under 128, okay, by issuing a compliance order. But in addition to that power to issue a compliance order, 128 gives the regional director the power to suspend or to close, to suspend business operations or to close uh, uh, businesses based on violation by the employer of health and safety rules. So that would be the only basis for ordering suspension of business operations or ordering closure of a company, violation of health and safety rules. In this regard, please take note of the two, 2008 Marka per case. Not yet given in the bar, but very much uh, a part of uh, uh, exercise of uh, jurisdiction by the regional director. What happened in Marka per? The company violated anti-pollution law, resulting in the pollution of the Bowak River in uh, Sambales. For that reason, the DENR issued an order suspending the mining operations of Mar Copper. What was the immediate result of the suspension of the mining operations of Mar Copper? Loss of employment on the part of the affected miners. Okay. Now, when suspension or closure is ordered resulting in loss of wages, there is a remedy under 128 that allows the affected workers to seek payment of replacement wages. And exactly that was what the miners to their union did. They ran after Mark Copper to seek payment of replacement wages. Case reached the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said the company could not be ordered to pay replacement wages under 128. Why? Because that duty to pay replacement wages uh, attaches only if the order is issued by the Department of Labor and Employment. So take note that the order of suspension was issued by the DENR and not by the Department of Labor and Employment. Of course, you know that it should not matter who issued no, the uh, order. What matters is the violation to the company. Okay? So it doesn't matter if the law violated is labor law or uh, environmental law. As long as uh, the result is loss of wages on the part of the affected workers. But the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court. So you have to abide by its ruling in Mark Copper. Only uh, impose the duty to pay replacement wages if the closure or the suspension is ordered by the Department of Labor and Employment in the exercise of inquisitorial power. Now, <coughs> Labor uh, Department finds that EER exists or does not exist. Take note that Bombo Radio says that that factual finding is not preliminary in character only okay? because uh, meaning uh, that finding is not reserved for the NLRC to finally resolve because uh, the power to make a finding of EER is coextensive with visitorial power. So the Department of Labor and Employment can make that factual finding. And that finding is not preliminary in character only. No? Not preliminary in character only, meaning it cannot be reviewed by the C. Okay. So those are the important as, uh, aspects of uh, labor jurisdiction, rules on jurisdiction, Confirmment of jurisdiction, acquisition of jurisdiction, exercise of jurisdiction. Let's now go to judgments. Judgments, of course, must be based on uh, evidence and law. 
Let's go to appeals now. Again, let's move from the office of the meta arbiter and then to the, uh, I mean, voluntary arbitrator and then to the left to the office of the meta arbiter. Where do you bring your appeal from the VA or where do you appeal the VA's uh, judgment or decision? Answer is uh, CA, Court of. So we have no problem with that because uh, Rule 43 no, requires that the yeah, decision of the VA be appealed to. Our problem is the period for appeal. Based on Article 276, the appeal period is 10 days. Because the provision says that if the VA's order is not or decision is not appealed within uh, 10 days, then it attains finality, it becomes enforceable after 10 days. So under the Labor Code, the appeal period is uh, 10 days. But under 43 of the Rules of Court, the appeal period is 15 days. So which controls now? Is it 10 days by provision of statutory law or is it 15 days by provision of the Rules of Court? So we have a conflict here, no? So let's uh, try to understand the uh, problem here. Rule 43 allows the filing of an appeal on the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th day. But based on Article 276, on the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th day, the VA's decision has attained finality already. And therefore, okay, that appeal would violate the principle of finality of judgments. So, based on that, as observed by the Supreme Court in at least two cases, the case of Baronda versus Court of Appeals and the case of Philippine Electric Company versus Court of Appeals, no? the appeal period should be based on the labor code and therefore 10 days, 10 days. But forget about Baronda and Philippine Electric Company because in 2018, the Supreme Court gave us a new ruling in the case of Guagua National Colleges. Guagua National Colleges versus Court of Appeals, where the Supreme Court said we have to apply the two periods. We apply the 10 days under the, the, the Labor Code and the 15 days under the Rules of Court. So that is the new rule now. 10 days pertains or is the period for filing an MR, while 15 is the period for filing a petition for review. So be very, very um, clear about that. No? Both periods shall be uh, observed. 10 is the period for filing an MR. 15 is the period for filing a petition for review. So I believe that is all that really counts, no? Uh, relative to uh, appeals involving VA decisions. What about labor arbiter? Uh, available to the NLRC. Have no problem with this one, except perhaps Article 225, Paragraph C. Can the National Labor Relations Commission resolve an issue not brought on appeal? The uh, old thinking was that uh, Article 218, Paragraph C, which is now Article 225, Paragraph C, permitted the Commission to resolve unbrought issues on appeal. Okay. Because the provision uh, permits it, it still not permits no, the NRC to correct errors committed below. So on that basis, uh, it was uh, thought that the NLRC could resolve unbrought issues. New rule cannot resolve unbrought issues. Why? Lack of appellate jurisdiction. So an issue has to be uh, raised on appeal okay, in order to allow uh, its uh, resolution. Regional Director. His 129 uh, decision is appealable not to the Secretary of Labor, but to the NLRC. And take note that the appeal period is shorter. It is five days only. Appeal period in labor cases is always 10, except in two instances where the period is shorter. It is five days only. The first situation is appeal under 129, okay, involving simple money claims. The second situation is an appeal involving an apprentice. So, uh, are the issues a decision involving uh, an apprentice, that decision is appealable to the Secretary of Labor and Employment within five days only, five days. 128, compliance orders are appealable to the Secretary of Labor and Employment within 10 days. 
then this is the appeal period. Now, here is an interesting uh, point. Under the rules of procedure of the NLRC, there is that remedy you call motion to reduce appeal bond. So if the client, okay, if the uh, employer does not have one million by which to uh, pose as appeal bond, uh, he is allowed to, in the meantime, uh, file a motion to reduce appeal bond within the appeal period of the 10 days, provided that uh, he raises in his uh, appeal memo or in his uh, motion to reduce appeal ban, meritorious grounds for reduction of, his, uh, of the appeal ban. That remedy is available in appeals taken to the NLRC involving simple money claims. Why? Because uh, appeals uh, or decisions rendered under 129 are appealable to the NLRC, and therefore, you should apply the same rules of appeal which include uh, that remedy of motion to reduce appeal ban. But you cannot file a motion to reduce appeal ban under 120. So when challenging an appeal, a compliance order issued under 128, you do not enjoy that remedy. Why? Because of DO 183-17, which uh, prohibits okay, certain pleadings. So there are prohibited pleadings under the DO one of which is motion to reduce appeal ban. So that is a prohibited uh, reading. When arbiter renders a decision granting or denying a CE petition, that decision is appealable to the Bureau of Labor Relations. Now take note at this point of the interplay of jurisdictions uh, between the med arbiter and the regional director. It is uh, the med arbiter to, who, who hears a petition for a certification election. What happens after uh, that? The case goes to the regional office for the purpose of conducting the election. After a winner is determined, the case goes back to the med arbiter who certifies the winner or the exclusive bargaining uh, representative. Now, <clears throat> suppose there is an election protest. Okay, That is an event that happens before the regional office. So the appeal should go up to the Secretary of Labor, not to the Bureau of Labor Relations. But affairs no, uh, that take place before the med arbiter are to be brought up to the Bureau of Labor Relations. So uh, we are done with the aspects of exercise of, of appeals. Let's now go to enforcement of uh, judgments. Enforcement, no problem. You can apply your rules in civil procedure, actually. What is of special interest here is the principle of piercing the veil of corporate fiction. During enforcement of judgment, the labor arbiter issues an order piercing the veil of corporate fiction of company B for the purpose of enforcing his, his uh, judgment against that company. Can he do that? Take note that uh, from the inception of the case before the labor arbiter, company was B was never involved. In other words, company B was never impleted in the case. Now, he cannot uh, pierce the veil of corporate fiction of company B during enforcement of judgment. Okay. Why? Supreme Court in Kukan International 2010 told us that piercing the veil of corporate fiction is not a means of acquiring jurisdiction but a means of determining liability only. Again, piercing the veil of corporate fiction is not a means of acquiring jurisdiction but a means of determining liability only, which means that company B has uh, a demand of uh, due process must have been impleted from the very start. But by way of exception, the Supreme Court gave us Dutch Movers 2017. During enforcement, piercing the veil of corporate fiction can uh, be uh, done as against a, a party not impleted in the case where there is evidence, clear evidence, convincing evidence, that its uh, corporate veil is being used okay, intentionally to evade enforcement of judgment. So even if that uh, other company has not been impleted, even if jurisdiction over its person was never acquired, its uh, corporate veil can be pierced so that the uh, judgment can be enforced against it. So that is uh, actually very uh, oh, So those are the important aspects of labor procedure, which uh, I believe 
okay, are of points of interest to any bar examiner, especially your examiners, three of them, uh, this coming uh, November. So with that, uh, we end aspects of labor jurisdiction. Other aspects will be tackled in subsequent uh, lectures. So we hope to see you during the regular review and during the week.
Only a just me, Yeshua says, Warrant or Warrant of us, nobody else. That is very important. And before it just me, it should search for a door, one of the breasts. What are the requirements? First, there may be trouble cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four, particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending on the Supreme Court now, diba? Right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize ang ceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidified. within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code. As a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Owner, owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, they may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repel an act. Issuance of a warrant of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause by the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest. So, okay, well. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant, as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath or affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proven. Okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by a, by the previous uh, investigator, during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po, the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So, this are the...
Only a just me, Esho says, Warren to Warren to Christ. Nobody else. That is very important. And before a just me, Esho says, Warren to Warren to Christ. What are the requirements? First, there may be trouble cause. Number two, to be determined personally by the judge. Number three, after examination under oath of the complainant and the witnesses may produce. Number four, particularly describing the search, place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized or arrested. Those are the requisites before a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest. But first of all, take note, only a just be issued search warrant or warrant of arrest, nobody else. That's why uh, it's still pending on the Supreme Court now, diba? Right? Article 3, paragraph 3 of the family code, we have the provision for a marriage ceremony. Now, in our jurisdiction, we do not recognize ang ceremonial marriages. There must be a marriage ceremony. The minimum requirement is that the contracting parties must personally appear before the solemnizing officer and personally declare that they take each other as husband and wife in the presence of at least two witnesses of legal age. Now, even assuming that there was no uh, witness here, the marriage will also remain valid. That will be considered a mere irregularity that will not affect the validity of the marriage. Now, under Article 26, Paragraph 1 of the Family Code, all marriages solidize... within the contemplation of Article 4 of the Revised Penal Code. As a general rule, threat to spouse, that is threat, that is a felony. Tinakot mo sasaktan eh, papaluin eh. Pero in this case, the threat to spouse is a justified threat to spouse due to the circumstance of no, de uh, defense of property. And second, the threat to spank was made in the exercise of a right under the self-help doctrine, Article 429 of the Revised Penal Code. Owner, owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude others from the enjoyment or disposal thereof. And for this purpose, they may use force which is reasonably necessary to pre prevent or repel attack. Issuance of a warrant of arrest is to follow blindly the finding of probable cause by the prosecutor, precisely because the prosecutor determines probable cause for the filing of the information in court, whereas the judge determines probable cause for the issuance of a warrant of arrest. So, okay, well. Pero sa issuance ng search warrant, as mentioned, it should be proving. In other words, my friends, the judge must personally conduct an examination of the complainant and the witnesses um, that he may produce under oath or affirmation. The examination by the judge must be proven. Okay? It is not enough to merely adopt the questions and answers asked by the, by a, by the previous uh, investigator, during the PI. Magkaiba yun. Bakit? Kailangan po, the judge should personally examine the complainant and the witnesses. So, it's our thing.